Remember the Peugeot 3008 Hybrid 4? Well, here's the second generation, the Opel Grandland X Hybrid 4. Before we go any further, make sure that the subscribe button is grey, not red, and that the bell icon is fully grey with some dashes around it. That way you're notified every time I post, and that's usually on Friday, so even if you're not into cars, you'll at least know it's the weekend. Win! In 2017, the French car giant PSA, which owns Citroën, DS and Peugeot, acquired Opel from GM. This made PSA the second largest car conglomerate in Europe after the Volkswagen Group. Since then, new Opel models were launched on PSA platforms. The Opel Grandland X debuted at the 2017 Frankfurt Motor Show and it is currently Opel's largest SUV or rather a crossover, it replaced the Antara, which was also known as the Chevrolet Captiva. Built on the PSA EMP2 platform, underneath the Grandland X is the Peugeot 3008 and the Citroën C5 Aircross. But I suspect if I didn't tell you that, many of you would live in oblivion, because at first glance there aren't many obvious similarities. Maybe except for the gear selector and the hybrid 4 badge. The Grandland X debuted with a PSA 1.2-liter 130-horsepower petrol 3-banger and a 1.6 120-horsepower diesel. Since then, the 1.6 diesel has been replaced with a 1.5 130-horsepower diesel and there is also now a more powerful 2-liter diesel. All the engines are from PSA and the 1.5-liter unit is not a Ford engine, as some of you may suspect. Regardless of the engine variant, the Grandland X, like the 3008 and the C5 Aircross, was a front-wheel drive car only. Until the plug-in hybrid version arrived. First, let me clarify that PHEV doesn't imply all-wheel drive. PSA offers a less powerful 224 horsepower front-wheel drive PHEV as well as the 300 horsepower hybrid 4 model, and today I'm testing the latter. The Opel Grandland X Hybrid 4 is propelled by two electric motors, 110 horsepower in the front, 113 in the back, and there is also a 200 horsepower 1.6 petrol engine. The power doesn't sum up because then we would have a 400 plus horsepower car. I think the only factory stock ish Opel making more than 300 horsepower was the 2011 Insignia OPC or VXR. Unlimited. There was also the 1990 Lotus Omega, but one Lotus, two limited run. How does it work? Under the boot floor lives a 13.2 kilowatt hour traction battery. I won't blame you if you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So, a fully electric Peugeot 2008 has a 50 kilowatt hour battery almost four times as much. The E2008 has a realistic range of about 300 km and the hybrid Grandland X about 50 km in EV mode. Realistic because Opel claims more. Electric range depends on many factors, but to simplify, let's assume it's hard to get the optimum conditions where you don't have to drive too fast, there is a lot of opportunity to coast or brake gently, the interior has been preconditioned while the car was still charging, and preferably the weather doesn't demand for excess use of cooling or heating. As I'm recording this, we're experiencing a heat wave in Poland with temperatures during the day around 30 degrees Celsius. So I'm getting up to 50 kilometers range, while Opel claims the Grandland X Hybrid 4 should do about 57, 59. So it's similar to Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. But unlike the Outlander PHEV, the Grandland X Hybrid 4 
goes like the clappers. It accelerates from 0 to 100 km per hour in 6.1 seconds. There is a lot of torque and the drivetrain is less complicated or less advanced for you three diamond fans out there. You can either drive in electric or hybrid mode. There is also a sport mode, obviously. There is no battery charge mode, but you can set the battery charge level so that you can keep, for example, 10 or 20 kilometers for the last leg of your journey around town. There is also no 22 kilowatt charging on board. As standard, the Grandland X Hybrid 4 takes 3.7 kilowatts and you can pay 490 euro extra for the optional 7.4 kilowatt charger. Charging from a standard home socket takes about 8 hours and from a Type 2 socket about an hour and 45 minutes. How is it to drive? Most of the time you don't think about it. You just get in and drive. When the big traction battery is depleted, the car goes into regular hybrid mode. In emergency situations, when you really step on it, the petrol engine may kick in even in pure electric mode, but under normal circumstances there is no need for that. The ride is more relaxed than sporty and that's in line with this car's character. This is supposed to be a family car which you can drive safely on a twisty road in all-wheel drive mode. This is when both electric motors work. Or you can go into sports mode, which is when the petrol engine powers the front axle and the electric motor powers the rear axle. And I shall demonstrate how fast it goes. Once you're out of electric energy, in regular hybrid mode, the car uses about 6 to 7 liters per 100 kilometers on the motorway, 7 to 8 liters around the city. Opel promises 1.5 liters per 100 kilometers, but that's assuming you're charging the car every opportunity you get. And for most people, that means overnight at home. Paddles on the steering wheel are not for setting the energy recuperation level. Like in the Outlander PHEV, there is a B mode on the gear selector, and that's that. The paddles are to shift gears in the rare situations when you're in sport mode and you're like really on it. Soundproofing is average. On the motorway, there is noticeable wind noise. I also observed when in EV mode, the Grandland X is quite noisy from the outside. When filming the drive-by shots early in the morning on an empty road, I could hear the car coming from behind a corner some 100 meters away. It was mainly tire noise and I suspect it's got to do with the weight of the car. Probably with this much power, grip was a priority, rather than low rolling resistance tires and low noise. As far as grip is concerned, I took the Grandland X Hybrid 4 up my test slope where I drive up diagonally, stop halfway and then try to move again. Although you can force the car into an all-wheel drive mode, this is not for off-roading, it's for grip and stability on the road. First attempt was in normal electric mode and the second attempt was in all-wheel drive mode. To be honest, in fully automatic mode the car did better. The Grandland X interior shouldn't surprise anybody who's driven an Opel in the last decade or so. Most of the switch gear is still Opel, although some elements started migrating from PSA, like the gear selector, the electric window switches or the infotainment system. However, Opel insists on leaving physical AC controls and that's a good thing. Speaking of AC, I had to search long and deep for the departure time settings to precondition the car while it was charging. In the dedicated hybrid menu, there is only the charging time setting so that you can take advantage of lower rates. The departure time setting is buried deep in the AC settings. Cup holders are rather for cans or small cups than for big bottles. They are also not as flexible as, say, in a Jeep. Therefore, larger bottles end up in the door bins where they are bound to fall out on tighter bands. 
Storage under the armrest is small. It features an optional induction charger, but if you want to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you still need to drag a USB cable to the cubby at the bottom of the center console. In the best PSA fashion, the USB port is hard to reach and someone before me tried fiddling with it, so now it's loose and Android Auto keeps disconnecting. Also, every other day the car unpairs from my phone and I need to pair Bluetooth again. You can blame it on my phone, but I used the same phone in many other cars over the last year or so and I had no issues of this sort. In the back there is sufficient legroom and headroom. The seat is set to my driving position. I'm 175 centimeters tall. The floor is flat, so the middle passenger shouldn't complain too much. There is one USB port, one 220 volt socket, and some AC vents. Cup holders in the armrest are on the small side, so larger drinks, bottles have to go in the door bin. And there is also a ski hatch. At 390 liters, the boot is 124 liters smaller than in the internal combustion engine model. There is some small storage under the floor, including a place for the charging cable. So that's a plus. There's also a repair kit. You can close the tailgate using gesture, a button on the tailgate, or with a remote control. Prices of the Opel Grandland X Hybrid 4 start at 51,000 euro. That's about 11 grand more than the most powerful diesel in the same trim. The front-wheel drive hybrid model is only 5,000 euro more expensive than the diesel. This test car in ultimate trim with options costs about 55,000 euro, so about 4 grand more than the larger and more spacious Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. However, the Grandland X Hybrid 4 looks and drives like it was designed recently and designers had the driver and the passengers in mind. Here in Poland this car doesn't make sense but there are countries where buying an EV or a PHEV is cheaper in the long run or even outright than buying a car with an internal combustion engine. Assuming this is the case take the Outlander for a spin and then get the Grandland X. And how do you like the Opel Grandland X Hybrid 4? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, subscribe, click the bell icon, turn on notifications on your mobile device so you don't miss new episodes. I post every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time, just when you have an hour or two to kill in the office before the weekend but the boss won't let you leave. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.